it's not easy for anybody. Um, but I know that, you know, at the end of the day, she you know, she chooses me and I choose her. Um, and therefore, you know, whatever whatever we have to tackle together or individually will always be us together as a team. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, Duke and Duchess of Sussex, are the modern day fairy tale we deserve. After all, don't all little girls daydream of being set up on a blind date with a real life prince? It was one of the first things we started talking about when we met was just the different things that we wanted to do in the world and how passionate we were about seeing change. I think that was, um, mm. that's what got date two <laughs> in the books probably. But it hasn't been all unicorns and rainbows for Harry and Meghan. The wedded couple have weathered so many storms and media scandals that you'd think they'd been married for a decade, not a few short years. Meghan has been the picture of grace and poise, and Harry has pushed back against every royal protocol set in stone to defend and support his wife. I know that I'm in love with this girl, and I hope that she's in love with me, but we still have to sit down on the sofa, and I still, you know, I still have to have some pretty, you know, frank conversations with her to say, look, you know, what you're letting yourself in for, it's a big deal. The decision was clear, duty or love. Will their decision to start a new life in America distance them in more than just miles from Harry's royal family? Their new life in Hollywood has changed the course of royal history forever. When they were growing up, William and Harry's relationship was incredibly close. The two of them really needed one another. They had a, a, you know, an unhappy home environment. They were, luckily they did have nannies and they were therefore kept away from quite a lot of the acrimony that was going on between their parents. But nonetheless, you know, children pick up on, on things. They're very sensitive. And it was also fortunate that they went away to boarding school because again, that removed them from most of, what, of the nastiness that was going on. But they did rely on one another. They were very close. The, the two are very different characters, but they, they complement one another very well. And they've always had a great banter. They tease each other mercilessly, or used to. And then when their mother died, I think that brought them even closer together because they couldn't share with anyone else what they had experienced. It, it wasn't, you know, like the death of, a, of any other any normal parent because in, with the death of a normal parent you don't have the world grieving as well. It was almost as though their grief was being devalued by the grief of strangers. So I think it was a very difficult time for them and, and during that sort of the, the years after Diana's death there was a bond which was closer arguably than, than most siblings. I think the time when that bond started to fracture a bit was when Harry probably came out of the, uh, out of the army and started going into royal work. And I think there was a little bit of, the space was, was quite small within their charitable world for the two brothers together. And I think Harry slightly railed at the hierarchy here was his brother, you know, his mate, but who was slightly pulling rank at times because where, you know, because he was the senior senior member of the family. So I think there were one or two little niggles going on there. I suspect that when William married Kate, I mean Harry adored Kate and Kate adored Harry, but I suspect that as with every family, when one sibling marries, their focus turns slightly onto their, their new wife or husband um, and then their children. And uh, where previously their full focus had been on the sibling. So I think maybe, you know, there were rumblings, but Harry, you know, got on very well with them right up until I would say the time that he met Meghan.
On January 13, 2020, royal watchers were on the edge of their seats as Harry and Meghan entered into what was infamously called a crisis meeting with Her Majesty the Queen, Prince Charles, and Prince William. This was a deal or no deal moment. The royal family's future was hanging on the outcome of this critical talk. After several tense hours, Buckingham Palace announced with a heavy heart that arrangements had been reached for Harry and Meghan to leave royal duties behind and pursue an independent future. I mean, this is the real problem for the Queen and Prince Charles. They are dealing with this as a grandmother and as a father on the one hand, and they're also dealing with it as the protector of a ancient dynasty. And we have seen that how as protectors of the ancient dynasty, when they need to, they act brutally, as they did with Prince Andrew when they removed him from public office. There may be a point that at some stage that the Queen, Charles and William believe that what Meghan and Harry are proposing is a threat to the institution of the British monarchy, then they will act. Well, I think these decisions have all got to be made in the future. Anybody who's high profile needs the protection. Former prime ministers and ministers of defence uh, get security for a long period after they've left office. So I think that's something that everybody would suggest that they require to get uh, security. But these decisions will surely all be made in the, in the next few days. All the way through this relationship, we've seen examples of Harry trying to protect Meghan from the scrutiny. You have to remember, Meghan comes in the legacy of Princess Diana, and Harry saw the way his mother was treated by the press. And I think he's very keenly aware of how that happened and, and ensuring that that doesn't happen to Megan. The decision to move away from Central London to go to Frogmore Cottage and move to Windsor is very much about protecting Megan. You know, they had just redecorated the place in Kensington. They had just done it up the way they wanted to when they announced they were actually decamping and moving to Windsor. By moving to Windsor, Harry and Megan are hoping to preserve some semblance of normalcy for themselves and for their child. Even if you look at the birth of the new baby, whereas Kate Middleton was trotted out in hosiery and full makeup just hours after delivering her babies, Megan said from the beginning, I won't be doing that. They didn't even announce she was in labor until after the baby was safely born. All the way through the birth, even in the last weeks of her pregnancy, Megan was not seen. And all the way through her birth, Megan has maintained a determination, along with Harry, to keep certain things private, to keep protected their family. And they are not following the royal script. They are consistently deviating from what's been done before. And some people think it's admirable, and some people think it's not. But ultimately, Megan and Harry are doing things their own way. Public reaction was divided. While some wished the couple nothing but happiness and success, others felt resentment in abandoning the crown and country. The media press of it really speaks to the culture war that's happening in this country between older, the older generation is outraged by Harry and Meghan's decision and the younger generation, um, which is mostly supportive. I think the whole plan that Harry and Meghan have is a really problematic one because they're talking about stepping back. They're talking, their critics would argue, about having their cake and eat it. They're talking about one day representing the Queen on a foreign tour to a, a, another country, on another day, say, in North America, earning serious money with some sort of endorsement of some sort of product. The, the risk is that those two things aren't compatible. The risk is that their pursuit of money will uh, tarnish the Windsor brand and tarnish the House of Windsor. There's no doubt that the reaction inside the palace was just as divided. This is the last time we'll see the Duke and Duchess of Sussex with the Queen and the royal family on an engagement. And it's significant that it is at Westminster Abbey because this is where the Queen, who is dedicated to the Commonwealth, also took her oath and obligation to serve in her coronation in 1953. And it's really a sign that, you know, that sense of lifetime service is what the Queen has given. And this is an abdication by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to step away from that by their own choice. And the Queen's pointing out, you're either in or you're out. It's definitely sad for the team at Buckingham Palace. They have a superb team there who've been fiercely loyal to them. 
I think the assumption will have been that there would have been possibly a core um, number of staff who would have been retained to run some kind of operation here for them. They've decided against that. They're severing all ties. It's a really strong signal that they are off on their own now in America and Canada. The now free couple announced a new future of financial independence, stepping back from the royal family, but insisted they would continue to support their causes. And of course, Her Majesty the Queen. They shared plans to split their time between North America and the UK. It's felt like their farewell UK tour. Five engagements in five days, covering off the official, the causes that matter to them, and taking time to say thanks to their friends. But it is the event they'll attend here at Westminster Abbey that is the most significant since they've returned from Canada. Because when they arrive at the Commonwealth Day service, it will be the first time that we've seen them alongside other members of the family since they announce they want to step back as senior royals. And everyone will be watching the body language. Every year since they got married, they've been to the service. Reaching out to the Commonwealth has been a big passion for both of them. Their attendance this year will be a reminder that whatever has gone on behind the scenes, they are still family, as this is one event that is hugely important to the Queen. When they got engaged, there was a sense this was a couple excited about what they could achieve together. A few days later, they carried out their first walkabout, but the scrutiny has proved too much and palace life too stifling, leaving the Queen with no option but to agree they can step away at the end of this month. In just over two years, they have fulfilled every aspect of royal life. Today is expected to be the last of those official duties. In the end, their life together had to come first. I think Meghan loves fashion, so she'll have some big fashion moments along the way. She really isn't afraid to experiment with what she's wearing. She will wear bright colours, she will wear amazing dresses, but I think her natural look is very laid back, California, cool, ripped jeans, baggy t-shirts, maybe some sportswear. She really kind of has lots of different fashion moods and, and looks good in all of them. And just like that, as quickly as the whirlwind romance had started back in July of 2016, less than three years on, they were gone. It has been widely commented upon that Harry and Meghan kind of rushed into things. You know, they, they, they'd they only been dating a short time and then they went to the Invictus Games and they announced an engagement and now they have a baby. They haven't been, you know, sitting around. I think from Meghan and Harry's side, they knew quite early on that this was it. However, there's been a lot written about the fact that when Harry's friends and even perhaps his own brother uh, cautioned him that perhaps things were moving too fast with an American who was unfamiliar with the royal demands and perhaps the royal system. Harry did not react well to that, and by all accounts, all reports, was furious with anyone who dared to question Meghan or her suitability or whether or not Harry was in fact sure. And Harry has cut people out of his life, according to the reports, based on the fact that they weren't welcoming and accepting of Meghan. Harry has been faultlessly loyal to Meghan from the beginning. In fact, when Meghan and Harry were first just dating, he issued kind of an unprecedented love decree to the press, saying, I'm dating her, she's important to me, and basically back off. It was unprecedented. I mean, for him to go out public to the press and, and defend her, it goes to show even from the beginning how protective Harry is of her. You're not gonna get any insight from me, but you'll get an opinion about a couple who've got yeah. married and are finding themselves in a state of shock at what the the world is, uh, the world that they're, they're in. I think yeah. Harry, you could say, was used to it already. Sure. But she certainly wasn't. And, no. And as a couple, and. And they're trying to do their best for their marriage, and right. you've got to you've got to commend that. So for her final appearance as a official senior member of the royal family, the Duchess of Sussex wore this amazing Amelia Wickstead grass green kind of outfit, and I think it was just a perfect symbol of everything that was going on in that moment. So it had this beautiful cape detail, which almost sort of fluttered behind Meghan as she walked out of the church, and it was as if she was actually flying away, and it, that's how the outfit made her look. But I think the green colour was very clever as well. You know, it's, it's a calming colour, it shows renewal, it shows 
new growth ahead. So I think it was a very optimistic statement after what had been quite a fraught time. But she also just looked incredibly sophisticated, incredibly chic in that moment as well. She made such a huge effort and I think it was a really lovely way to end that chapter of their lives. The couple decided that they wanted to leave royal life behind and make a break for freedom, but the palace were not receptive. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan considered the extreme measure of breaking royal protocol to contact the queen as tensions grew in the royal family. Despite the infamous crisis meeting to decide their future on January 13th, the couple announced by March 31st, 2020 that they were officially leaving the royal family, would no longer use their titles and would become financially independent. I think it's an exaggeration to say that, you know, the monarchy finds itself in a moment of, of turmoil, flux and a genuine crisis because, of course, this has opened up a Pandora's box. There are so many wider issues at stake. The future of the monarchy, this streamlined monarchy that you keep hearing people talking about. What does that actually look like if Meghan and Harry do step down? Uh, a lot of you tonight have told me you have my back. Well, I'm also here to tell you I've always got yours. Republicans say they can't simply pick and choose which perks of the palace they enjoy. You know, if they want to live privately, then they need to renounce their titles, abandon all claims to all public uh, funding, and go and do their own thing. And had they done that, I'd be standing here cheering them on and saying, well done you. But they have not done that. They still want to uh, cling on to uh, the purse strings of the British taxpayer and they still want to have that status that we have given them. There is a certain amount of security, whether or not he wants it, that he just needs because of what he's born into. On their new website, the Duke and Duchess published what was effectively a manifesto of how they're going to deal with the media in future. And part of it was an attack on this and specifically British media and royal correspondents for their monopoly on royal coverage and essentially accusing the media of making private profit from their very public lives. They talk specifically about the Royal Rota, where British media cover royal events to be distributed around the world. Obviously claims they feel they've been hounded by the media, etc. But in reality, they've had, there's been nothing like that. Um, Oh, come Royal, on, you would say that. No, the Royal Rotor system works, I think it's given them an awful lot of works for a... It's been going since the 1950s. And one must remember that this is an unelected institution that relies upon media, publicity, the public support for its life's blood. They are in control, they release the images, they choose who comes and talks to them. I mean, that's a relationship that works in Hollywood, that's a relationship that works with celebrities. It's a great open question whether it's a relationship that can work with a senior active member of the British royal family. I think the relationship has got worse and worse, not least because of his relationship and now his marriage to Meghan Markle. I think he, ever since he set eyes on Meghan and fell in love with Meghan, he feared the day when he might lose her, and he believes that the media may play a part in his losing her. As a first step to independence, the couple founded Archwell Incorporated, a nonprofit foundation for change. The couple founded Archwell Productions and signed multiple huge deals with Netflix and Spotify for a series of inspirational documentary and podcast productions reportedly worth around 18 million pounds. Megan fell pregnant very quickly. They hadn't been married that long when she got pregnant. And according to all reports and rumors, they just had just started trying and she got pregnant. Now, Megan was not... Uh, extremely young, you know, in, in pregnancy terms, 36 is geriatric. I mean, that's literally the term. So I think they didn't want to wait around. They knew they wanted a family and they didn't know how long it would take, but it happened very quickly. And I think both Megan and Harry were surprised at how quickly it happened, but it's all the more of a blessing. Megan is very much a belly cupper. Every single picture we saw when she was pregnant, she was cupping that belly. Sometimes we had a double cup above and underneath the belly. You know, this is something a lot of celebrities do on red carpets. Meghan Markle is a celebrity. She's an actress. She knows about angles. She knows about what makes a good picture. She knows about what's a good story visually. She's smart and she has used some very smart strategy in her role. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way, to, to use the knowledge you gleaned in one field and career in another one. Meghan Markle has been one of the most stylish pregnant women that we've ever seen. She didn't favor maternity clothes. She tended to wear designer clothes which would accommodate her bump. Meghan has a very slim 
long, lean, beautiful figure. And she was able to wear designer clothes all the way through. She looked gorgeous the entire pregnancy. The only visible difference apart from the bump was her face was perhaps a bit fuller and, and actually it just made her look even younger to have the kind of rosy cheeks that she had through the pregnancy. Pregnancy very much suited her and I would be shocked if this is the only baby that these two are going to have. Megan's pregnancy was actually announced during her first royal tour and there was a backlash actually because it was announced so soon after Princess Eugenie's wedding. A lot of people felt that it had stolen the thunder for poor Eugenie who had gotten married literally like the day or two days before. It was ridiculous because Megan has the right, first of all, to announce her pregnancy anytime she wants to. And probably they waited until after Eugenie's wedding to announce because they didn't want to steal her thunder. But Megan was in the middle of a royal tour in which she was probably going to miss engagements due to morning sickness or fears for her getting pushed to jostle too much in the crowd. She had to explain herself and she had the right to stay home if she was tired one morning when she was in the early throes of pregnancy. So I think Meghan and Harry felt they had to announce in a way because she was in the middle of a world tour, she probably was gonna get a little more tired and there might be obvious bump pictures which would just set off a fury of speculation. Megan showed very early in her pregnancy. She was only a, a little bit pregnant and she already had a bump. So I think it was a necessity really for Harry and Megan to announce the pregnancy as early as they did. Prince Harry, um, do you want to share with, with us the world? Uh, yes, um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Megan and myself had a baby boy um, early this morning. A very healthy boy, um, mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience <laughs> I can ever um, possibly imagine. Um, how any woman does what they do is beyond comprehension, but we're both absolutely thrilled um, and so grateful to all the love and support for everybody out there, um, from everybody out there. It's been, um, it's been amazing. So we just wanted to share this with everybody. I'm so incredibly proud of my wife. Um, and as every father and parent would ever say, you know, your, your baby is absolutely amazing, but this little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for, so I'm just over the moon. Megan's baby shower was very much a baby shower for a celebrity, not a baby shower for a royal. I don't even know if Kate Middleton had a baby shower, but if she did, it was probably like in someone's house with a cup of tea and like a few finger sandwiches. This was not gonna be this like amazing, over the top celebrity fueled, filled event. Megan did her baby shower as a celebrity. It was thrown by a celebrity, Serena Williams, and it was attended by celebrities and it looked like something celebrities would go to. Megan in unfairly really got a lot of backlash because the truth is how many women are involved in the planning of their own baby shower? The answer is zero. Megan had probably nothing to do with it, had knew nothing about it except that she was supposed to show up in New York on this date. And Amal Clooney said, look, I'll give you a ride in my jet. The over-the-top extravagance of the shower has more to do with Megan's friends than it does with Megan herself. One thing that was very sweet about the baby shower was Megan actually didn't open any of the presents. She wanted to wait and open them together with Harry. She took them all home with her and they opened them together as a couple. This is really unprecedented. I mean, normally one of the highlights of a baby shower is watching the mother-to-be open everything. So this broke with tradition, but she didn't want Harry to miss out. In the lead up to the birth, uh, Harry and Megan both said they didn't want to know the sex. They wanted it to be a surprise. So they had to obviously then choose girl and boy names. Had it been a girl, Diana was very much a favorite name and I believe it was very likely that Diana would have been the first name or at least in the middle of that um, long name and the reason is you know from the beginning Harry and William both have included their mother whenever possible in their relationship and I think it grieved them both that she wasn't there when they married uh, she wasn't there to see her grandchildren and so I believe with all my heart Diana is probably in future going to be a girl's name for this pair. In terms of boys' names, there were a lot of names initially floated around. They were all connected with royal tradition, but not typically traditional. So for example, Alexander, which is a perfectly acceptable English royal name, but not as commonly used. And, and other sort of middle names that the royals have had, like Arthur, were two of the names that were favored at the beginning. On March 7th at 8 p.m., CBS aired the landmark interview led by TV legend Oprah Winfrey. 
The two-hour interview caused incredible fallout, the magnitude of which still cannot be fully understood. It was the interview that some within Buckingham Palace must have feared, but Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's discussion with Oprah was more revealing, explosive, and potentially damaging to the royal family than many could have imagined. Harry and Meghan left as working members of the family, left the country, went to Canada first, then America, and then gave that devastating interview to Oprah Winfrey, in which Meghan said that Kate had made her cry just before her wedding over a bridesmaid's fitting, where there had been a rumor long before that Meghan had made Kate cry. So in this interview, she wanted to correct that story and make it clear that Kate had made her cry. Allegations of racism within the family itself and Megan's admission that she felt suicidal during her pregnancy have been splashed across newspapers in the United Kingdom. And throughout their two-hour TV special, Harry and Megan spoke with eye-opening candor, delivering accusations and rebukes that outweighed even Princess Diana's landmark interview more than two decades earlier. Prince Harry's relationship with the media went bad and has got progressively worse ever since uh, his mother died. He believes uh, deeply and profoundly that the media contributed to his mother's untimely death. So ever since her death, he has tried to find an accommodation. And that accommodation has been his acceptance that the intense interest in him could be used by him to throw uh, focus on issues that he is passionate about. Harry claimed that when they left the UK for Canada, Prince Charles stopped returning his calls leaving them feeling like they were on their own. I think it's probably very difficult being the second son because you don't really have a defined role. You're just the, the joker in the pack. The, the, the attention is very much focused on the eldest child, as it was with William. I mean, Diana made a very conscious effort not to allow that to happen, but of course it did. Harry became important by you know, being this big character, being this brave boy. So I think it is. It does. It does affect these kids. I mean, when you look at Princess Margaret, she never found the happiness she should have done. She was always completely in the shadow of her elder sister because her elder sister was queen. Megan, can you tell us what it's like becoming a new mum and tell us a little bit about Baby Sussex, as we're calling him? <laughs> um, it's magic. It's pretty amazing, and I mean, I have the two best guys in the world, so I'm really happy. Tell us a little bit about um, your son. What's, what's he like? Is he, is he sleeping well, good baby? Yes, he has the sweetest temperament. He's really calm and... Um... Uh, he gets that from <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and he's, been, he's just been the dream, so it's been a special couple days. Who does he take after? Does he look like anyone? We're still trying to figure that out. Well, everyone says that babies change so much over two weeks. We're basically sort of monitoring how the, uh, how the changing process happens over this next month, really. <laughs> his, his looks are changing every single day. Yeah. So, who knows? And how you find parenting generally? What's it? Is it still a special moment? Yeah, it's great. I mean, parenting is amazing. It's, it's only been, what, two and a half days, three days? Yeah. Um, but we're just, we're just so thrilled to have, have our own little bundle of joy. Um, and be able to spend some precious times with him as he slowly, slowly starts to grow up. <laughs> and uh, I hear you're going to you're off to see two special people in the minutes. Yes. Um, the Queen and, and the Duke. Yes, and we just bumped into the Duke as we were walking by, which was mm. so nice. So um, it'll be a nice moment to introduce the baby to more family and my mom's with us as well. So it's, uh, it's been a really... Here we go. Guys, nice, thank you. Thank very, you all very so much. much. Thanks for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. And thank you, everybody, for all the well wishes and the kindness. Mm. It really just means so much. Behind the tall walls of Windsor Castle is where fewer than 25 guests were invited to witness the newest royal baptism. Those invited taken discreetly to the tiny private chapel. Outside, though, the streets were thronging with people. Those hoping to catch a glimpse of the royal christening, though, were left disappointed. We do pay for the royal family, including uh, Meghan and Harry, 
and I think that they could have given us a little, you know, um, a little something. I think it should be public, you know, it always has been, why, why change it? It's their decision, it's their family, um, it's not as if they're direct uh, in line. And this royal watcher says the public may have to get used to this royal couple's desire for privacy. Well, it seems to be the case that Harry has decided he wants his little boy to have more of a private life. He feels he's a long way from the throne and wants to enjoy some type of privacy. But it could be a problem because no matter what you do, he is growing up in a royal goldfish bowl. He has got two of the most famous parents in the world. Today's christening is a very different royal event, part of the continuing desire by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to raise their son Archie out of the spotlight. And they're a couple determined to do things their own way. According to Harry, the royal family completely cut him off financially around the first quarter of 2020 when they decided to become independent from the royal family. And this left him concerned for his safety and the safety of his family. He said that he is now living off the inheritance from his mother. The most complicated of all the issues raised by the couple's decision to step down is their protection, specifically what form it will take, who will provide it, and who will pay for it. Prince Charles has agreed to keep funding the couple and their son from his own private income, but by stepping back, Harry and Meghan will now be able to work. There are still lots of details to work out, but Harry and Meghan will soon be embarking on a new life and a different kind of royalty. It was a terrible interview, which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist, and did huge damage to Harry's relationship with his father and with, with William. Harry also accused his father of cutting him off financially, which we now know actually wasn't true. We now know several things that were said in that interview were not true. Megan claimed that she had experienced racism from certain undisclosed members of the royal family who questioned her about her son Archie's skin color. They both suggested that someone in the family had made a racist remark about the color of the baby's skin. And Harry talked about William being trapped in a lifestyle and from which he had been trapped himself and hadn't realized he was trapped until Megan had had made it clear to him. You know, Megan herself has talked about the challenges of being biracial. She has said, you know, I wasn't black enough for the black roles, I wasn't white enough for the white roles, and I was in the middle as a mixed race woman. And her journey has been in part to find the strength and dignity and passion for that role and, and embodying a beautiful, strong, mixed race woman and all of that means. You know, Megan is re-educating people. There's never been a mixed race royal baby as we have now. And this is an incredible thing. I remember I was at the royal wedding when uh, Megan and Harry got married. I was in Windsor. And I remember there were a lot of women there who were black with little girls, with daughters who were celebrating this special day. And people can't have any idea what a big deal this is for there to be a black princess, for there to be a mixed race princess, because we haven't had that before. And I think that just by virtue of the fact that Megan is who she is, inspires people, inspires young girls, inspires women, and that's a beautiful thing. The royal family cannot survive if it doesn't evolve and it, it, it reflect the world at large. And to be entirely white, it certainly does not do that. So Megan is representing, just by virtue of the fact that she's accomplished and beautiful and smart and talented and mixed race. And it's a wonderful thing. It's great for the royal family. It's a great for everyone else. Oprah went on to clarify that the couple made clear that it wasn't the queen or Prince Philip that made these remarks. Either way, the palace released a statement addressing the alleged racism. The palace said, Recollections may vary, but the matters would be handled privately. The big royal wedding that cost 40 million pounds and was watched by the world? Turns out it was a performance. The couple claimed they'd tied the knot in a secret ceremony three days before the big event in their backyard. Perhaps most troubling were Megan's claims that she experienced honest and frightening suicidal thoughts due to such intense tabloid scrutiny and isolation at the palace. Becoming a royal meant giving up a lot of personal luxuries and independence. Megan also claimed that it was disparaging that the palace refused to correct false statements about her. 
I don't read anything. Yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> much safer that way. Um, but equally, I, that's just be my own personal preference because I think positive or negative, it can all sort of just feel like noise to a certain extent these days. Um, and so as opposed to getting muddled with that, to focus on the real cause. So for me, I think the idea of making the word feminism trendy, I, that doesn't make any sense to me personally, right? This is something that is going to be part of the conversation forever. And, you know, for me, it's a it's a tricky one because I'm not part of any of that. And again, like, as, as Adam would know, I don't look at you it. You never look at, say, Twitter? No. <laughs> Sorry, no. Um, you know, and I, for me, that is my personal preference, right? There were rumors that Megan was bullying some of the staff. Her method of working was not what they had been used to. Whether it was because she was American, whether it was because she was um, a, a movie star who treated people in a different way, it was not what had happened in the past within that royal household. And I think William, when he heard that some members of staff were being reduced to tears or not enjoying their working life, I think he got very angry and he confronted Harry and told him what was going on. And Harry, I think, was protective of Meghan. So that is where I think the seeds of it all, of, of a fracture in, in this bond that had been so close came from. Then, of course, Harry and Meghan left as working members of the family, left the country, went to Canada first, then America, and then gave that devastating interview to Oprah Winfrey, in which Meghan said that Kate had made her cry just before her wedding over a bridesmaid's fitting, where there had been a rumor long before that Meghan had made Kate cry. So in this interview, she wanted to correct that story and make it clear that Kate had made her cry. They both suggested that someone in the family had made a racist remark about the color of the baby's skin. And Harry talked about William being trapped in a lifestyle and, and from which he had been trapped himself and hadn't realized he was trapped until Meghan had made it clear to him. It was a terrible interview, which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain, as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist and did huge, huge damage to Harry's relationship with, with his father and with William. The main event in the Sussexes' lives was the birth of their second child, Lilibet, in June of 2021. My husband and I are thrilled to soon be welcoming a daughter. It's a feeling of joy we share with millions of other families around the world. When we think of her, we think of all the young women and girls around the globe who must be given the ability and support to lead us forward. Their future leadership depends on the decisions we make and the actions we take now to set them up and to set all of us up for a successful, equitable, and compassionate tomorrow. Just days after their daughter's birth, Megan released her children's book, The Bench, inspired by a Father's Day poem she wrote for Harry. It became a New York Times bestseller within a week of release. The couple have also taken part in their fair share of activism. On her 40th birthday, Megan filmed a video with U.S. actress Melissa McCarthy to launch her 40 by 40 mentorship campaign, raising awareness about the women who globally have lost their jobs due to COVID. As campaign chairs of Vax Live, my husband and I believe it's critical that our recovery prioritizes the health, safety, and success of everyone and particularly women who've been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. With the surge in gender-based violence, the increased responsibility of unpaid care work and new obstacles that have reversed so much progress for women in the workplace, we're at an inflection point for gender equity. Women, and especially women of color, have seen a generation of economic gain wiped out. Since the pandemic began, nearly five and a half million women have lost work in the US and 47 million more women around the world are expected to slip into extreme poverty. But if we work together to bring vaccines to every country and continent, insist that vaccines are equitably distributed and fairly priced, and ensure that governments around the world are donating their additional vaccines to countries in need, then we can begin to fully rebuild. Not only to restore us to where we were before, but to go further 
and rapidly advance the conditions, opportunity, and mobility for women everywhere. For all the scrutiny that Harry and Meghan have to endure, it's easy to forget the couple is using their platform to reach out to others through their work in public service. From building their Archwell Foundation in 2020 to the small ways that the couple gives back, Harry and Meghan continue to work and find ways to positively impact the world and create a better future for children. Meghan Markle is not someone who just wants a pretty designer dress and, and a glass of champagne. She is actually engaged and interested in the politics and the storylines of where they're going. In fact, she got in trouble when she met someone in Ireland who was in Parliament, I believe, and congratulated them on the defeat of a bill that would have uh, nullified abortion in Ireland and said, you know, that's great, and ended up getting in trouble because the, the Irish politician tweeted, oh, I had this great conversation with Megan and she congratulated us on the defeat of this um, initiative. And everybody was like, you can't take a side, Megan. You can't defend any position. I think one of the most difficult, challenging things for this whole, in this whole experience for Megan is the royal tradition of not taking a side, of not uh, showing your political leanings, of not having opinions. That is something that I think Meghan Markle ha has already and will very much continue to struggle with. Just recently, Megan was seen paying her respects at Robb Elementary School bringing a bouquet of flowers and taking her time to take in the tragedy that claimed 10 children and two teachers' lives. It's small moments like this and significant occasions like the NAACP awards or the couple's trips to New York City, where Megan and Harry are using the spotlight that's been thrust upon them for some good. The consequences for the monarchy and the Queen's heirs reach far beyond the restrained hoopla of the Jubilee weekend in 2022. Harry and Meghan's presence at the event, according to one member of the extended family, was a test tube of future dealings, an attempt to find more stable ground between the Sussexes and the core royals and move beyond the cantankerous dealings of the past 18 months. So for the Platinum Jubilee, there'd been so much build-up about Harry and Meghan's attendance at the celebrations? Would they steal all the limelight? Would there be some big family drama? There was so much kind of build up and tension around it all. So for Harry and Meghan's kind of big moment appearance during the celebrations, Meghan chose to wear a Dior couture outfit in a very muted greyish tone. So this kind of gray meets beige color. Again, it was very subtle look. Lots of other members of the royal family were wearing very bright colours, so it really stood out in a way that she was wearing more of a neutral shade. I also thought it was very interesting that the whole outfit was created by Dior, a French fashion house, a favourite of Princess Margaret. I think it's quite a, an almost kind of rebellious choice but also a very fashion forward one. And she looked beautiful, but I think it didn't kind of take away all the attention off the other members of the royal family, which was very clever. For a queen with such a deep faith, missing out on St. Paul's was a disappointing, if necessary, decision. But she was watching. She was looking not just at the service, but at the future of the monarchy. It couldn't have been easy. Outside, they were greeted by cheers from the crowd that way outweighed the booze. That would have been heartening for the couple in light of so much bad press about them. This wasn't their first public appearance as a couple at a royal event in more than two years. It was a significant state event, a thanksgiving for the Queen's unprecedented reign in the hollowed surroundings of St. Paul's Cathedral. Inside, they made their way down the land aisle, heads turning as they went along, and television cameras locked onto them in an almost uncomfortable way. Anyone hoping to see rifts from the past couple of years healed in front of the cameras were left disappointed as Harry and Meghan took their seats amongst junior royals. Since the former Duke and Duchess of Sussex left royal life for Los Angeles, tension has mounted between the two households. I think Meghan really used her fashion to remind us that she was no longer in the royal family. So we saw lots of snapshots of her in very casual outfits, actually, you know, wearing ripped jeans, wearing relaxed shirts, but also at home in California, wearing big relaxed sundresses as well. So these were outfits that you would never see on the kind of Buckingham Palace balcony, but were really her way of showing that she had a new life the world demanded answers and so much more than they could have ever imagined after the infamous interview rocked the world 
and left the royal family on the brink of disaster. Has their dramatic exit from royal duties changed royal history forever?